Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Ontario NEAR webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to be um, speaking with Steve Keekins. But first, I'm going to introduce um, knowledge holder Clay Shirt, and he will um, do an opening for us this morning. Miigwech, Clay. Miigwech, miigwech, Roy. Uh, bonjour, my relatives. I'm glad, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you're all here in this um, webinar. I just want to do a traditional opening. Uh, I know traditionally we'd be all together in person, but um, so it's just in this way, and I'll just sort of, you're, you're all invited to the circle and, and just sort of in your own mind, just in, in your own view, just sort of picture we're all together, but we're virtually. So uh, usually there's somebody who does the opening uh, and uh, invites spirit in. So I just want to say miigwech. So I'll just want to say begin. I'll begin with uh, uh, opening prayer. We always like to begin with a prayer, and uh, I just like to say this: take a moment or two or three, and just um, begin. I just want to say miigwech again. I pray to our first mother of all mothers, our mother the earth. Again, I pray to her. I pray for her in gratitude. I ask her to to bless us all physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. We come together as a people. We say miigwech to her. I say thank you for the medicine she provides for us to, to sustain life, the food to sustain life. I say miigwech to her. I love you. I say miigwech to our first mother of all mothers, our mother, the earth. So with one mind, one heart, I say all my relations. I send my prayers, my thoughts to Father Sky again and again. I partition, I ask the spirits of my ancestors, those good, beautiful ancestors, to be with me and to be with you, wherever you are, your ancestors, to guide us, to give us strength physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. We give thanks to our ancestors, those beautiful ancestors. We pray to you, I say in gratitude for all these being with us for all he's loving us. I say miigwech to you. With one mind, one heart, I say all my relations. I offer my prayers to the sun, grandfather sun, for giving the appearance of rising in that sacred doorway, that Eastern doorway. I say thank you for this new day, this new beginning, for bringing the warmth, for making things grow for us, the people and our, re our relatives, the four-legged, the crawlers, the swimmers, the flyers. I say thank you for this. We're bringing the light, we're making things grow for us, the people. I thank you, Grandfather Son, for this day. And again and again, I ask for you to return, but I thank you for this moment you, you present us with. And if I have done anything in the past, I have this day, this moment to make it right. And I thank you for this moment, Grandfather Son. So with one mind, one heart, I say thank you. I give my thoughts, my prayers. Again, I humble myself to grandmother of all grandmothers, Grandma Moon. You are so beautiful in the night. Again, I pray to you. Again, I pray for you in gratitude for everything you do for us as we sleep, as my granddaughter sleeps, as my children sleep, as my partner sleeps, as, my, as we sleep. You do this for us. I acknowledge this. We acknowledge this, the people. You put the waters, the rivers, the lakes, the oceans into order for us. For water is life. I acknowledge this at this moment. Lucamus, I love you. I say me which to you for everything you do for us. Grandma Moon, you are so beautiful. I say thank you. All my relations. I give thanks to you. I offer my prayers and gratitude to a great mystery and the creator. Again, I ask you to have pity on me that I forget so often that I am in the Shinabe before I'm anything else. But at this moment, I remember this and I love you. I say miigwech to you, creator, for this. I say thank you for this beautiful gift you have given us called life. I ask for the blessings for all of us in these very difficult, challenging times. But we come together as the people in this circle. I say thank you. Again, creator, for there is nothing beyond you, creator. I give thanks for this gift called life. All my relations. Miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. Thank you guys for allowing me to do this and welcome to everyone who's come here today in this virtual space. So I say thank you and I say 
all my relations. Hinkwich, take it away, Steve. It's all you. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, pleasure to be here today. You guys all look amazing. Um, <laughs> any least, uh, happy Friday. My name is Steve Teakins. I'm the executive director of Nominee Native Men's Residence. And, um, you know, I'm here to talk to you about our, our um, intensive case management program called Minno Kanagoan. Um, it, it's uh, an intensive case management program, which was a, a homemade response at NAMI Res to uh, address a lot of our um, male clients that have severe mental health issues and addictions. So um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint slide with you. Um, I'm going to get this ready. Uh, you know, um, I've worked at NAMI Res for uh, Geez, 13 years. I've been the executive director now for um, over 10, a couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, a few weeks ago was my 10 year anniversary. So um, anyways, I'm really proud of uh, the work we do and the, the staff that uh, do the incredible work with our clients. So um, the Mino Conagoan program, it started in, in February 2011. So 10 year anniversary for that as well. Um, uh, initially, the program was called the Special Needs Program, but you know, the, you don't see many people running around saying, "Hey, I'm in the Special Needs Program," right? It's it's sort of got a negative connotation to it with a name like that, and and people weren't walking around proud saying, "I'm part of the Special Needs Program." So we we gave tobacco to a traditional healer, and they came up with the name that was suitable for our program, which is Minokana Goan, and in Ojibwe. That means like changing my direction in life. So um, I guess I'll go to the next slide here. So, um, you know, NAMI Res, we're, we're a not-for-profit organization. We, we work with uh, men of all walks of life. Yes, we're an indigenous organization, but um, we provide a, a menu of services for um, indigenous and non-indigenous men that experience homelessness. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we offer um, temporary and, and permanent housing as well. Uh, we're an affordable housing provider. We also operate uh, um, outreach services and life skills programs and, and a variety of supports, all within a cultural context. So um, this is our org chart. Um, I hope you can see it clearly. Um, you know, a number of years ago um, in our efforts to indigenize our, our governance model at NAMI Res, we, we um, created this org chart. So, you know, traditionally at the mainstream organizations, the org chart would look like, um, you know, a pyramid eh, with uh, maybe the executive director at the top or the CEO. With this one, we, we kind of inverted it. And at the center of this one is the clients. I know other places might call the, their clients, you know, service users or members or, or other names, um, but uh, you know, just so it doesn't confuse others, we use the word clients. That's people who come to use our services and access resources. Um, around our clients, we, we wrap around our elders. So we have an elder on staff here, um, Osana Say or, or Alex Jacobs. Um, he's doing a lot of his work remotely because of COVID, but we also work with a variety of other elders and traditional teachers and knowledge keepers to um, ensure that our services are always culturally based and that our men um, are always, you know, have, have that, those cultural resources and those people that carry that wealth of knowledge to help inform them. Um, the elders and traditional people also interface with our staff and the various programs. So I know that this org chart, it looks like a, a beaded flower. So the red and orange parts are our programs and services. So you know, we, we have a continuum of care um, that, you know, reaches all the way uh, to those that are out on the streets and, and visibly homeless, maybe in encampments. And our, our Streets to Homes outreach team reaches out to those folks and, and, you know, offers them housing first before any other types of services. Um, and then we have in the green leaf, our NILOs, our Native Inmate Liaison Officers. So NAMI Res, you know, we, we see, um, incarceration as a pathway to homelessness, you know, because say if you do, you know, a few months in jail, um, you can't pay rent while you're in there because um, you don't have a, a, a source of income to pay rent. So it's very common for people to leave the correctional institutions to go to um, homeless 
situation. So we figured if we work with the, the guys in the local jails that uh, they'll be less homeless. And then we have our Saga Tape program, which is a transitional shelter program strictly for Indigenous men. And um, we also have a life skills program in Saga Tape called the Pindamoanin, which means having confidence in myself. And um, it, it promotes the number of hard and soft skills for our guys um, to help them um, leave Sagate in a better position than when they came in. And then the next leaf here is a Doje Mino Nesewanong. And this was a response to COVID-19 where NAMI Res partnered with a number uh, of folks, including our friends here at Waba Kines Bryce to help um, operate an Indigenous COVID response that's for Indigenous and by Indigenous people. So um, we have a building up here on Vaughan Road called a Doje Mino Nesewanong. And that's where we do our COVID testing uh, vaccinations and uh, contact tracing. We also have housing and uh, we have Ogichita Mishiki Wigwam, which is housing in Parkdale. We have Gnu Pune Okinagon, which is our housing in um, Cabbage Town area. And we've since acquired two more houses that are under development right now that will be eventually operating as affordable housing. Um, Nami Res operates a men's shelter. That's where Nami Res started our services from. And uh, it's an emergency shelter. Pre-pandemic times, it was 71 beds. Um, with social distancing requirements, we're down to 44 beds. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have uh, our chef is our cook. Uh, we say our kitchen is the heart of the organization because that's where all the healthy medicine we call food comes from. And, um, you know, we're very pleased we have a chef that cooks very healthy and nutritious meals and cooks it with a lot of love and care because food is medicine and we want to make sure that... Uh, a lot of positive energy goes into that food because that's what nourishes our bodies. Um, we also expanded our, our programs to offer an outreach service in York region. It's called Onijin Winadmo, which means our, our hands will help you. And it's a service in York region where we offer uh, you know, outreach services to Indigenous people in that region that are homeless. Uh, and then today I'm going to talk to you about the Minokanagoan program. So this is uh, very much, this pictorial is a uh, a picture of a flower. I often tell our frontline staff who interact directly with the clients that, uh, you know, these might not be the prettiest flower around, but you're a flower that does a lot of good for people. And then the black area of this org chart is our administration team. And uh, they're the folks that, you know, keep the wheels of NAMI Res moving to make sure that uh, our staff can offer direct services to people. So it'd be like our, our finance office, our human resources and all those fun things that are very necessary to keep an organization running. In the red circle around this flower is my role as the executive director. And I'm often looking inwards and looking at the programs and making sure that we offer programs that are very helpful to people and they serve their purpose. I also look outside to community to make sure that uh, I can bring in new resources for um, people in our organization, uh, you know, that to enable them to do their jobs a little bit easier, maybe you know, uh, filling gaps in services for our Indigenous guys that are experiencing homelessness. The white circle around the red is our circle of directors. You know, a lot of non-Native organizations refer to their circle of directors as board of directors, but NAMI Res, we, we have a circle of directors and it fits nicely in this wheel. Um, and then the blue circle is community. Our circle of directors are members of our community, Indigenous community. And, um, and then the yellow circle is the life cycle wheel going from uh, toddlers all the way up through the life cycle up to elders. And that's the community that we serve and um, we try our best to serve it well. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little snapshot on, on Indigenous homelessness in Toronto because it, it's very pervasive. Um, so you know, every so often the city of Toronto does this, this uh, census called the street needs assessment. And the last one was done in April of 2021. And um, you know, it's not estimated, they counted over 7,347 homeless people in the last street needs assessment, including 742 that were living on the streets. And of those uh, people that um, were counted in that census, you know, 15% uh, of all the homeless people in Toronto were Indigenous. And 23% of those outdoors on the streets were Indigenous. So, um, you know, Indigenous people in Toronto, we represent about one to two percent of the overall population in Toronto, but yet we're overrepresented among 
the homelessness numbers. So um, you know, it points to a systemic problem. And you know, there's a number of barriers that you know homeless and <clears throat> homeless indigenous people face. And often there, there's common issues. And, and some of the common issues are, are issues that stem from colonialism, such as uh, residential school impacts, um, adoption scoop, and then, <clears throat> excuse me. Not feel better. Anyways, um, and then people that, that uh, you know, other barriers they face are health related issues, sometimes, uh, um, can we be mental health issues, racism, stereotyping, and profiling? You know, indigenous homeless people are the most indigenous people in any given city where, where they reside. Um, and then often they face stigma and systemic barriers within the, the system, whether it be the health system, um, you know, in the shelter system, um, you know, more or less within the social safety net system. Um, and then, um, you know, they often deal with lateral violence. Um, often indigenous homeless people are disconnected from their family and community um, because they're in Toronto. So say if you're from a First Nation community and you come to Toronto to look for better opportunities, um, you don't find them right away and, and you end up homelessness, you know, homeless. You know, it's not something to be proud of and report back to your family or community that you know, that's how you've ended up. And then um, we work with a, a lot of mental health and addictions as well. Uh, a lot of homeless people are obviously experiencing poverty. Homelessness and, and language and literacy are also barriers that our, our, our men face. So um, a lot of the barriers that, are, that uh, you know, Indigenous homeless people face are, run the gamut of um, um, you know, the social determinants of health and often we're at the bottom end of all those indicators. So, well, come on, slide, move on me here. There we go. So here's a little bit of a background about our Minokanagoan program. I'm not gonna read it to you. I'll, I'll, I'll describe this in my own words. Um, I know uh, in 2011, before we started, um, it was noticed that we had a lot of indigenous men coming to us with um, you know, concurrent disorders, which were either mental health and addictions or, or just mental health or just addictions, but they were severe. In, in some cases. And we recognize that sometimes, you know, they would come to us for a brief period of time and then move on to another shelter. Um, some, whenever they would come back, we noticed that many of them were either in the same condition when they left us with their concurrent disorders or mental health and addictions or addictions issues, um, or even in worse shape. And that's when we realized, hey, these guys are falling through the cracks. You know, wherever they go, they're, they're not getting the help that they might need to address their, their concurrent disorders. So maybe we've got to do something to help them because they're, they're falling through the cracks. So we created this Minokanagoan program. We were able to um, do some grant writing and, and we were successful. And we hired a, a nurse and some case managers to work with uh, our, our guys that were experiencing concurrent disorders. Um, and as I, I expressed earlier in this, um, highlighting the street needs assessment. You know, indigenous people are overrepresented in, in homelessness and often um, you know, are at the bottom end of the social determinants of health. So um, when the program started, you know, we started with the humble beginnings with a nurse and, and two case managers. Um, the program has grown over time. Now we have uh, four staff associated with the program, uh, the nurse that helps. But we also leverage some clinical supports as well. And um, you know, we work with Inner City Health Associates, or ICHA is their acronym. And they're, they're a group of doctors and psychiatrists and nurse and medical staff that work with uh, homeless people in Toronto. Um, they'll often work in various shelter settings. Um, and with NAMI Res, we partnered with them to access a psychiatrist who, who works with our guys a, a half day a week. Um, we also, we're able to secure a medical doctor. And, and uh, we're very fortunate that we have an indigenous medical doctor that also comes in a half day a week and works with our guys around their um, medical issues. So, um, you know, we've been very fortunate and able to leverage those supports through inner city health associates. They've been fabulous partners. 
Our psychiatrist has been with us right from the beginning. I, I know often in our Indigenous communities, uh, it's common to see an influx of professionals kind of flying in and flying out uh, over brief periods of time. And it's really important that, um, you know, when people work in the helping field, that they work with our community for the long term. Because often trust is an issue for a lot of people, and it takes a long time to build that trust. And if you're working with a psychiatrist, you know, and you're often sharing stories about maybe a, a troubled past, about trauma. So you don't want to be repeating that story every so often when a new worker comes and goes. So it's really key and important to have staff that are in it for the long term. Um, the psychiatrist usually uh, works with um, our guys and will provide diagnosis for those who maybe not have been diagnosed in the past. Um, she won't do it over one session. She usually do it over a few sessions to come up with a diagnosis. And um, Usually around 80% of our clients also suffer from substance abuse as well as often a, um, a mental, undiagnosed mental health issue. So, um, you know, the Minokanagwan program also created a partnership with U of T's School of Nursing and Pharmacology. And in the past, uh, pre-pandemic times, you know, we've hosted um, student placements to work with us. Um, and our pharmacological students have helped our staff to understand uh, the various antipsychotic drugs and how they work, to understand the side effects. I know in the past when we've had nurses come in from the School of Nursing at U of T, uh, they've come in and done a variety of projects, usually around health promotion and working directly with our, our nurse. So, um, you know, during pandemic times, I know in the first wave, we had those same students uh, from U of T come in and help us, but they did work remotely and we give them various projects to work on. So. Um, you know, the program has been very successful in leveraging various clinical supports um, to help you know, assist our, our guys that use the program. Um, we also have a, um, a new group where uh, the case manager and our psychiatrist you know, started a, a psychosocial group for our men. Um, and uh, you know, it's arts-based program. It works on things that uh, they have natural abilities and talents in, so it's strength-based approach. Um, and it really goes a long ways to help create that helpful working relationship with our, our clients. You know, when you work with people from a strength-based model, it's an opportunity for our clients to shine, to be proud about themselves. So rather than going through sometimes invasive assessments that look at the efficiencies that people have. Um, offering um, services from a strengths-based approach can often be refreshing for the people that use our services. Um, and then, you know, we also have clinical supports from our, our local uh, pharmacists up on uh, St. Clair and Vaughan here. And um, he runs a methadone clinic. And, and uh, you know, we also partner with local community health centers as well. Um, so um, we, we've been successful in leveraging you know, essential clinical supports for our guys. And, and um, you know, if they weren't participating in the Minokana Goan program, they probably wouldn't have been able to access, access those services all by themselves. So the Minokana Goan team consists of, of our program manager, the physicians from inner city health associates, the three case managers, and, and um, you know, as an Indigenous organization, we try to take a holistic approach and meet the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional needs of our clients by providing them a multidisciplinary team, which includes uh, also traditional elders and teachers um, who will deliver circuit, circles, uh, counselors, client care workers. We have an Ashko Bewis, which is uh, uh, an Ojibwe word, which means like a ceremonial helper or a traditional helper. Um, and, uh, we, we have, um, you know, coordinator client training and other services um, that are helpful that will help those guys. So um, basically it's three full-time case managers focusing in, in various sectors such as health, housing, and culture. Usually Tuesday mornings, the psychiatrist comes in. The general practitioner is every Wednesday afternoon. Um, we did have a dietitian that would help with the guys sometimes. And um, you know, since COVID, we haven't really rekindled that relationship, um, but we will as soon as this darn COVID is over. Um, 
And then um, we also um, have life skills programming for the guys. So uh, the Minocon go and program when um, it's an operation, um, you know, they'll, they'll work with the guys in, uh, you know, if they're in the shelter and, and homeless and, and staying in the shelter, we'll, they'll work with them to get stabilized. Um, even if they're not stable, we'll also work with them on a housing plan to make sure that they're housed. Um, once they're housed, you know, the work doesn't stop there and, and like, okay, problem solved, we're done. Nope. Uh, they'll still do follow-up services, those same case managers and the nurse sometimes. Um, and they'll uh, make sure that they're successful in their housing. You know, it's often, you know, engaging with a, a, a landlord. So the staff will also engage with the landlord to make sure there's no barriers to that will impede their ability to be a tenant. Um, and sometimes it, it's a little bit of mediation if there's problems. Um, and, uh, you know, we find that when they're housed, some of the guys, they used to really isolate and just stay in their house and not go out. So what we started doing was created recreational groups for the guys so that, you know, other folks that may have similar um, concurrent disorders, you bring them all together so they feel less socially isolated. Um, and we'll do various life skills programming, such as cooking classes, uh, um, a chiropodist, uh, that's the foot doctor, you know, come in and, and make sure their foot health is okay. You know, often diabetes is a common ailment too among one of the clients we work with. So, um, you know, foot care is extremely important. And then also working with a dietitian. You know, sometimes some of the meds the guys are on are, are hot on their bodies and, you know, making sure that their physical health is, is optimal with a, a healthy diet. A dietitian will help them, you know, uh, be successful that way. Um, this is some of the clinical stuff that they do, which I'm not going to get into too much, but we use uh, various case management tools. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we do an intake as well. Um, and often, um, you know, the program's have been evaluated a couple times over it, its 10 year history. And um, one of the things we, we found in one of our evaluations uh, was that, uh, you know, the staff uh, for a period of time, um, we're working with, with some of the, the guys who maybe had less severe needs. And, and you know, I, I know when I was a frontline worker, you know, you, you, you often wanna, um, grab the low-lying fruits, right? Because they're easy wins. But with this program, it was created to to work with those who had the most severe needs. So we introduced a, a, a an assessment tool to to rate their needs. And those who have the highest needs are those that who we work with. So there's an acuity scale, and those who have the highest levels of acuity in terms of their needs um, will, you know, be the ones that they work. With. And those that have the lower amount of needs, you know, they'll be referred to other workers within NAMI res. Um, so uh, the case managers will conduct an assessment upon receipt of a referral or, or, or contact. Often the referrals are either from external agencies or from uh, within NAMI res, either one of our, our two shelters. Um, and we'll be, they'll determine the needs through an assessment. Um, through medical assessment, psychiatry, psychiatry assessment, housing, court, and counseling. And then they'll provide referrals to the needed services. And often they'll not just refer them and say, here, go to this address and get this service. They'll, they'll actually accompany them to those services. Um, and they'll advocate for and collaborate with existing services. So, um, you know how I talked about at the beginning where some of the guys might have been slipping through the cracks in, in various. Um, approaches, I guess, to working with them. Well, if, if you're these guys who, who you know, uh, are visibly indigenous, um, you know, they, they might um, appear to be homeless. If they went to a hospital by themselves, maybe to access mental health supports, they probably wouldn't get the A1 quality service, right? And that probably is why, you know, these guys have been slipping through the cracks for a long time. So if they go to the, um, a medical service or a mental health support and they have an advocate with them, like a nurse, 
who will ensure that they get good quality of services. You know, they'll know the medical system and help them navigate through it. They're going to get good quality service um, just because of that accompaniment. So um, client accompaniment is so important. And often when they're housed too, you know, the, the case managers or even the nurse will make sure that they integrate into their community, that they know where resources are in their neighborhood. You know, maybe um, you know, after paying rent, they may not have much money left. Eh? So often um, they'll find helpful resources like, uh, you know, um, free places to eat at a drop-in that might be in your neighborhood or a place to access a food bank or other helpful services in their neighborhood. So, um, you know, the staff will help them integrate in their community that way and know the resources themselves so that um, eventually they'll be able to access those services on their own and be more self-determining. Um, so we also um, you know, have the staff have client care meetings on a regular basis to you know, check in and see how uh, their, their caseload are, are doing. Um, you know, the, the case managers, they do intensive case management. So what that means is uh, they have a smaller caseload because some of the folks that they work with may have uh, um, really a lot of high needs. So um, they're able to work more intensively with them if they have smaller caseloads and, and see those clients more frequently as needed. So um, that's what our case managers do. So our approach is, um, as I've mentioned earlier, it, it's trying to work on strengths. So it's positive reinforcement, not punitive or punishment based. Um, you know, we work from a, a place of kindness with the people that we work with. I always try to instill, instill staff at NAMI Res that we always have to be kind to the people that come through our doors. Because um, I know in traditional Anishinaabe culture, you know, whenever we had a, a visitor come stay with us, you know, we would try to show them the best hospitality we can. Because that's just the way it is. So um, when people come to our doors at NAMI Res, you know, I ask staff to treat everybody with kindness. Um, because you may not know if you're working with maybe your coworker's relative or someone from your own reserve community and so on. So um, we also work from a harm reduction approach. So harm reduction is, um, you know, working with people without casting judgments on their substance use or, or alcohol use um, and work with them to, um, maybe reduce the harms associated with those, those um, uses of illicit drugs or alcohol so that their, their overall health will, will still be there for the long run. Um, you know, it, it can be tricky because both of NAMI Res shelters are, are um, abstinence-based shelters. So, um, you know, it's a bit of a balancing act, but I'm very pleased that NAMI Res offers a variety of approaches to, to people and, you know, not, a, not one single approach will work for everybody. So it's always important to have a diversity of ways in working with people. Um, and again, we, we look to a holistic model of providing supports that support the mental, physical, and emotional aspects of a person um, based on the medicine wheel teachings. And we also work from the seven grandfather teachings of, of providing services that are respectful in, in those ways. So, um, I'm gonna share with you a, a, um, a success story. You know, we've had a number of them over the years, but uh, I know it's often important to share various successes because uh, um, you know, it gives people some real life examples of how people are doing. So the names have been changed for this to respect the confidentiality of, of our clients. So um, I'll be using first names here. Don't uh, think you know who it is because we changed the name. So. Um, you know, Brad was living on his own with his rabbit bugs or bugs bunny, and he was struggling with his mental health issues. Um, the medication he had, had uh, been prescribed caused him to sleep all day. You know, it was a, a really uh, a side effect um, for him that, that his family had a difficult time in dealing with. So his mother, who became increasingly concerned about him, referred him to the Minokana Goan program at NAMI. Well, she heard through the community about this program and thought it might be helpful. So he moved to the NAMI Res Emergency Shelter and we began uh, to address some of his mental health 
uh, with supports of the Minokanagoan team. And the team supported him to regulate his um, sleep and eating patterns. Um, at the same time, they were transporting him to all the necessary appointments. And Brad indicated through the, the stabilizations that he, he found uh, great support from NAMI Res. You know, a year later, he had his own place and he was housed in, in one of the NAMI Res housing units, uh, the affordable housing that we had. And uh, he was really happy. You know, the stabilization of his mental health um, enabled him to return to his love of music. And uh, he plays in a punk band and he was producing his own demo tape and uh, continues to write his, his music. And I know for um, it's alias Brad, um, you know, he, he really has a passion for music and he's really talented and uh, he plays a lot of really cool punk music if you're into that. So um, that, that's one success story. And uh, how about another one? So um, again, this is another alias just to let you know. So Mr. Eastern came to Toronto from Thunder Bay in 2011. You know, he decided Toronto was a place to go to change his scenery. So at the time uh, of his movie, he was drinking quite regularly, which had, had you know, through his diabetes way out of whack. Eh? Um, so uh, he indicated that he was losing his sight because his diabetes was out of control. So with the support of the nurse, um, we were able to help him get into control um, his diabetes. And with no support and no knowledge of the city and services, you know, we ended up at St. Mike's Hospital for three weeks. He was eventually referred to NAMI Res because he was homeless. And when he arrived at NAMI Res, you know, his severe health needs and intellectual disabilities resulted in an immediate referral to the Minocano Goan team for case management supports. Um, so with the intensive um, comprehensive supports from the Minocano Goan team, Mr. Eastern lost weight. He got his diabetes back under control and he was able to um, get off of a, a daily in, um, insulin injection and was uh, you know, weaned off of that and was able to, to use uh, the various medications that weren't injection drugs uh, to control his diabetes. Um, when asked how he feels about the Minikonogoan program and how it's helped him, Mr. Easter stated, I feel better. I was sick when I started, but now I feel better. So, um, before his connection to Namiris and the Minokana going team, Mr. Eastern had no supports. And um, now he feels surrounded by people who care about him. He says, I like Namiris and the people there. They, they show me around the city and where to go and what to do. So um, I'm proud to report that now he's uh, you know, living um, in our housing and he still has those supports to support him to be successful. So um, you know, this program has been uh, phenomenal for these two examples of our success stories. We have many more and, um, and this program is really needed. Um, and uh, you know, in, in our efforts to secure um, core funding for this program, hopefully by the Ministry of Health or, or some sort of health funder, um, you know, we do evaluation. So we did our last evaluation in, in 2019. It was conducted by um, well Living House with St. Michael's Hospital. And, uh, you know, it, the evaluation was positive of the program and it, and it clearly showed that, uh, you know, the program does what it intends to do and that's work with, uh, you know, Indigenous men who have severe concurrent disorders or mental health and or addiction issues to help them become more stabilized and, and not be homeless. So I have a, a brief video I want to show you here. Um, and uh, I'll just stop staring the screen. And then afterwards, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. So let's see here, where is that video? There it is. So.
Okay. Uh, let me see. Stop share. So, um, I hope everyone was able to hear that. Okay. Uh, oh, hang on. Let me stop that. There. 
Okay. So um, anyways, um, so that was, was a, a nice pictorial example of, of our, our program evaluation. And, um, you know, if you had problems viewing that, uh, I'll, I'll give you the link um, for that, that uh, video. So um, I'll put it in the chat. You just can watch it maybe at your own time if you had issues uh, with um, hearing it. So um, I'm going to go to Q&A now. Um, so Hi, Steve. It, Suzanne here. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure uh, to welcome you here and to thank you for making the time to do this presentation. Uh, for us, it's really thrilling seeing this report, and it's too bad that uh, Dr. Janet Smiley wasn't able to join you today. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a few questions. Would it be okay if I asked you the questions? Yes, please go ahead. So, um, what have been some of the greater challenges that have come up for you, especially during COVID? Oh, wow. Um, well, it's to keep our services operational. Um, it's been a real problem. Uh, I know at our Namira shelter, we were the, I think the second shelter in the city of Toronto to have COVID. Um, you know, and to deal with it uh, um, head on with no supports uh, out there from, um, or guidance. And we, we managed to navigate it by ourselves. Um, and we did it quite successfully. Um, as a result of, of navigating our, our um, outbreak uh, by ourselves, you know, we, I realized our social safety net of supports that are supposed to be there to help were, were crumbling around us, as it seemed. Um, so we created our own Indigenous specific COVID response called the Doje Mino Nesewinong, which was uh, uh, our Indigenous COVID testing center and vaccination center and our own contact tracing. So um, it's been a trick to operate services that are, are you know, vital and important to work with clients face to face. Uh, we managed to do it. We also managed to, um, you know, keep all, all our staff in place. We did lose a few who, who felt they didn't want to work anymore in a shelter setting with COVID. So um, we're constantly hiring. So I guess the challenges associated with COVID were um, keeping our programs and services operational, which all of them have, we never closed. Uh, the challenge was of expanding services to meet unmet needs where other services may have, uh, uh, you know, ceased operation or, or contracted for a brief time. And then the other challenge is recruiting staff to, to provide those vital services. So um, I think we've done rather well. Um, you know, the Minocana Guam program and all their programs, they still um, provided services directly to clients and in person just uh, had to do it in a, in a you know, socially distant and safe manner. That sounds really amazing. Uh, I'm so impressed to hear the way that you um, were able to navigate through the challenges of COVID uh, just sort of by the grit of your own wit and figuring out what to do using, you know, your, what resources you had and the, uh, the, like the determination to keep services going for our people. That's, that's so uh, admirable and wonderful. So miigwech for that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we have any more questions and we do need to close. So um, maybe I would like to say thank you to Clay for opening uh, and doing the introductions. And thank you also, uh, Steve, for, for doing this wonderful presentation, which I'm reminding everyone will be archived on our website. Um, and we can provide uh, you, Steve, with the YouTube link so that you can promote it on your website. Mm -hmm. And we have many, many views afterwards. Sometimes people can't always at attend in person, but we get a lot of hits once we put it up uh, on the interweb. So, uh, so thank you for sharing this vital information. And uh, Roy Strebel, the near coordinator, thank you for coordinating uh, the technology for our event today. And Clay, if now is a good time, we'd love to invite you to do our spiritual closing. Oh, wish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, I just echo uh, Steve. Uh, awesome work that uh, you guys are doing over there, everything. And uh, just, I was thinking about when you were speaking, I was thinking all the fond memories because I used to come in there and 
and, and participate in some of those uh, programs there and help them. And it's a wonderful place to, to be. And uh, so with that, I just want to say miigwech. And so again, I just want to thank everybody for coming and taking the, the time in our in our busy lives. So I just say miigwech. So with that, I'll just, uh, we invite the spirit in. I'll just send them on their way wherever they need to go and, and advocate for us and work for us and, and speak on our behalf. So with that, I just want to say miigwech. And I just say, I want to say thank you. And I ask the spirits of my ancestors to, and the grandfathers and grandmothers, and it just to, to bless Steve and his family and to bless all his workers, to bless everyone there in a good way, in a kind way. And say miigwech to the, to the earth, the sun, sky, and creation. And I think I ask the creator to, to help us and to bless all the men who walk through those doors. And, um, and I know they struggle and, and I, I've witnessed it in so many we've lost, but so many we have, um, who, get the help that they they want that they deserve that they need and so i ask the creator to bless them and to bless all the ones that we have lost and i say miigwech to you creator and I keep our brothers strong and safe and then they bless all the men again and again who walk through those doors and all the workers i say thank you creator for this beautiful day and i say all my relations miigwech 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 thank you Steve, it's always a pleasure, brother. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah.